And let me introduce the section of uh, this chairman's dialogue. The current former uh, guest, current uh, for, and former chairman of IPCC, and also our guests from Macau, they are going to share on the achievement and lesson learned as the head of oversight bodies and how the roles of the bodies change in the social environment over the past year. And I will now pass the time to Mr. Lau, please. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mr. Leo mentioned in his um, remarks that we're going to look at history and then we'll go to look to the future. That's exactly what this session, the Chairman's Dialogue, is going to do. We will be inviting all the speakers to review and share with us a memorable experience during their term and to talk about aspirations for the future of the institution, what they want IPCC to become. And I believe that framework would give sufficient flexibility um, and focus for us to concentrate on what to discuss after each speaker finish his remarks. I would um, start with our guest from Macau, Mr. Alphys. Please share with us. Hello. Uh, good morning, everybody. Bon dia todos, so three languages. Cantonese, English, and Portuguese. So Macau uh, has its uh, own two official languages, the Chinese and Portuguese. I am uh, a mix, like Chairman Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> and first of all, I would like to make a disclaimer. Uh, my English is the worst here in this <laughs> auditorium. So if you don't understand what I say, please raise your hand. <laughs> I try to speak better and transmit my ideas. So I think the theme is very important and very interesting, the history and the future. So talking about history, uh, I would like to, in a few words, talk what is Macau? What was Macau? Uh, what is Macau today? And what will be our future? It's already, of, of course, connected with uh, our team today about uh, the police uh, uh, supervision of their discipline, ethics, and etc. So Macau uh, was a former uh, Portuguese, uh, I don't say colony because it's not written in our constitution, but uh, territory under, uh, it's a Chinese territory under Portuguese administration, this is the constitutional language. Uh, what uh, we have in the 1990s was a transitional period, just like Hong Kong had. Uh, in the 1990s, we, we face uh, difficult times. Uh, everybody knows, or everybody who lived at that time in Macau in Hong Kong knew that uh, we have a tremendous security crisis in Macau, uh, precisely 97, 98, so, so a few years before the handover. Uh, this fact dictated something uh, which affected severely the morale, the discipline of our police forces. Uh, and the police forces has also uh, faced a big challenge at the time of the transition. Uh, many upper level uh, officers uh, went back to Portugal and we needed to localize the, the local police. So a lot of things, uh, the new government, the first government of Macau Sa needed to do in order to enhance the discipline, enhance the morale, and put our police forces in the right direction in a city ruled by the rule of law. So uh, it's uh, very uh, reasonable to say that the Macau government made a big effort to enforce the what we call the internal control, the internal control of the police forces, and also created in 2005 uh, our council. Uh, is, the name is very long, 
but I, for, for easy reference, I call it Macau IPCC, if you are not sure. <laughs> <laughs> so it was created in 2005, the Macau IPCC, uh, with two uh, fundamentals. First is the external control in opposition to the so-called internal control of the discipline. External means the people composed by to, to the, in this organ are all from the civil society. Uh, at that time, uh, don't laugh, we were all, almost five, because Macau size was very small, cannot compare with Hong Kong. And then we increased to seven, and the next future we will be nine. Not enough, but uh, Macau has its own characteristics. Macau is a tiny city, a small city. Uh, our population is around 750,000. Uh, beside of that, we have a lot of tourists and uh, migrants and so on. So our population roughly is around 1 million. Uh, in terms of uh, human resources in our police forces, around seven, uh, 6,000. Almost triple the size when we started in, to, in the year of 2000. So Macau now is a different city of that one in the 90s. It is what a small city, a tiny, in, Hong, in many Hong Kong newspapers called it a, a tiny uh, village, <laughs> fisherman village. Nowadays, a quite cosmopolitan city with a lot of uh, infrastructures, economy is quite well, but also bring a lot of complexity in our society, and it's related with our police forces. So the external control, the one of the fundamentals to be external, all of as are from the civil society, and independent. Independent, I think this uh, fundament is very crucial. Uh, uh, without independence, the people, the population will not trust on us. So I'm happy to preside this council uh, 14, since 1905, for almost 14 years. And what I always ensure uh, is to guarantee in our daily affairs absolute independence. Independence towards the government, independence towards the pressures from the society, and there's only one way, only one aim and one objective is to serve the society, to serve the population under the criteria of legality, justice, impartiality, all these principles that are inserted in our basic law. So our basic law is our mini constitution. In Macau, have a lot, almost 30, 30 sections about uh, human rights. So this is our direction, how to handle our cases. And our final approach and final ob objective is to contribute to the improvement of the police image, the image of the police in Macau. The police to be respected in Macau, I think every part of the world is the same, to be respected, firstly, the police must respect the liberties and the civil rights, the human rights of the citizens. So this is our main uh, direction. Uh, when we are asked to analyze and make our judgments about the claims that we received. The time is a little bit short. I would like to show two or three examples of what we have done in these 14 years. One for me and for my colleagues is very remarkable. In the first years of Macau region, uh, as I said, the morale, the discipline was uh, not, wasn't the best uh, shape at that moment. So we receive a lot of claims of abuse of powers of the policemen inside the police stations when the people or the citizens are requested to make testimony or they are suspect of any crime. So they are under interrogation. We receive uh, claims saying that they are sometimes ill-treated and so forth. Uh, at that time, we talk uh, I was authorized by our colleagues. I talked with the chief executive of Macau, Dr. Ekman Ho, and he authorized us, council, to make a proposal of law 
And at that time, by, by coincidence, I was also a member of the Macau Let's Go. So I presented on behalf, uh, indirectly on behalf of our council, a bill to Macau Let's Go in order to provide more rights and securities to the citizens. And finally, we enacted a new law. And the new law says that all and any citizens can be assisted by a lawyer in any proceedings, criminal proceedings, civil proceedings, administrative proceedings, etc., in all departments of the government, in the courts, in the public prosecutors, so we precise more in the police stations. So everybody is entitled to be assisted by a lawyer. Independently, his status as suspect, as a simple witness, or other status. Because sometimes, a suspect can always say, I'm, I, I, I'm entitled to have a lawyer. And the trick is, you are requested to make testimony as a witness. So you cannot bring a lawyer. And during the interrogation, change your status into suspect. So it was quite frequent, it's a trick. So we enacted the new law that even if he is a, a witness or other status, he is entitled to have a lawyer to be assisted. So I think this law was uh, approved by LegCo in 2009 and bring a lot of benefits for the, for the enforcement, for the uh, enlargement of our securities, of our rights in Macau. Of course, one thing is the approval of the law, another is the execution of the law. And we counsel all follow closely the execution of this law. And we, with the support and the big cooperation with the security secretary of Macau, we have made a lot of small details regulations, such as uh, the citizen, when he asks for assistance of a lawyer, how long? He can wait until the arrival of that lawyer. So we make a consensus, maybe 20, 30 minutes due to the size of Macau is more than enough for the, <laughs> to, to the lawyer to reach there. And also we uh, make another consensus about the room, a private room that they can have a private conference without camera, without uh, interference of a third party. And most recently we have uh, we receive a, a, a complaint, a complaint presented by a lawyer who said that he tried to assist his client in the police station, but a lot of obstacles, uh, a lot of hurdles were presented. And he quarreled, made, had a conflict with somebody in the policeman, and the police indicted him of disobedience or whatever. I can't remember what was the crime and he was pro prohibited to provide assistance to his client. So we saw through the crime a very aberrant situation. The lawyer sitting in one room and his client, the suspect, seated in another room next to him. So it's a very strange situation. The, claim, the complaint was very <laughs> well presented and we concluded that a lawyer or solicitor is always a lawyer or solicitor until his license ceases to be valid. Until then, he has the right, the duty and the right to defend the interests of his client. So we made also like Hong Kong IPCC, we make our recommendations and we, I think one year ago, submitted this recommendation to the security secretary. Always well accepted. This is a fact all our recommendations. We made, I think, more than 100 recommendations in different fields, in different areas. And after the acceptance, of course, we have the follow-up proceeding, whether this is uh, reasonably understood and reasonably followed. So this is the most mm -hmm. remarkable. I can have another examples, but due to the time. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Office. Thank you. Um, adequate legal representation and timely legal assistance is definitely one 
very important feature in any successful dispute resolution mechanism. Um, I would then invite Mr. Robert Tang um, to share with us his experience during his term as chairman. Thank you. I was uh, chairman at an easier time. I was chairman from 2000, the year 2000 to 2004, April 2004, when I went on the bench. Um, at that time, because for historical reasons, the uh, IPCC had three vice chairmen who were all members of the Legislative Council and uh, who represented a spectrum of uh, political views. Uh, for those who do not know, maybe I should go a bit into history. The, we, we, we had our origin in the 1970s in what was known as the Umelco Police Group. Umelco is the acronym for unofficial members of the Executive and Legislative Council. Uh, in those days, all legislative councillors were appointed uh, by the colonial government. And naturally, <clears throat> and of course, executive councillors were also uh, appointed. Uh, and uh, these were the unofficial members. They had an office, and their office received complaints from citizens about police misconduct. So from the beginning, the uh, Umelco group was always chaired by an executive councillor, and they always had three vice chairmen who were members of the Legislative Council. Uh, my predecessor, Dennis Cham, was also a member of the Executive Council. I think I was the first chairman who wasn't, um, in, uh, I, who did not have any official uh, capacity at all. Uh, but because there were three uh, vice chairmen who play very important roles in the, um, in, the, um, in the IPCC. I think we were, even then, uh, by then, we were already known as the IPCC, although we uh, had not yet become a statutory body. Um, so they represented a spectrum of views. And our members, if one looks at our members, um, one could see that when they were appointed by government, they also had uh, in mind a balance. So you have people who are known for their views on law and order. You have people who are known for their views on civil liberties. So we had a, a, a mixed uh, a group of people. Uh, that can give rise to lively discussions. But I'm glad to say uh, that we always, well, almost always, manage to reach a consensus. And, uh, on the occasions where we cannot, we could not, we would have a vote on it. And, uh, and, and, and normally that is settled by a majority. I think only on two or three occasions I had to um, exercise my casting vote. So that was a, a relatively uh, easy time. And, the, and, and I think the practice of the IPCC was that we would, um, our counterpart, as it were, Kind of, well, the, 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 um, the part of the police with which we have, the, we have the immediate and direct contact was uh, papal. There's complaints against police office, which is part of, the, uh, part of the police. And normally, after the IPCC has reached a view on a complaint, um, capital uh, will then say whether they agree or do not agree with it. I think almost invariably, they agree with our conclusion. I only remember one occasion where we failed to agree. And at that time, um, the procedure was that if Keppel and IPCC could not agree, then the matter um, had to be referred to the chief executive for his determination. So the matter, I think, was referred to the chief executive uh, but before he could make his determination, um, I had become a judge and so ceased to be uh, chairman. Uh, but uh, 
I don't think anything really came of that uh, disagreement, because uh, in parallel with the complaint to the IPCC, um, there was also litigation, which eventually uh, ended up in the Court of Final Appeal. So maybe that's why the chief executive never had to make a determination. Um, I, I think um, although uh, we and our members represented different views, we were all independent, uh, neutral, we respect uh, each other's views. My, uh, I believe that tradition has continued. And uh, uh, that's why I was very uh, happy to read um, uh, what um, Larry said uh, in, in the report about the core values being um, independence and impartiality. I hope that, I, I, I have no reason to think that that will not continue. Uh, but I think in order to ensure that the IPCC should remain independent and impartial, one has to be careful when, when, when government decides on, the, on, on appointments. And uh, I hope uh, that the IPCC will continue to be made up of people who share different views and who are able to respect uh, different views. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Next, I would invite uh, Mr. Jack to share with us his experience during his time. Thank you, Kevin. Um, thank you, Tony, for inviting me. I think the last time I was in this beautiful venue, I was then the chairman of IPCC. <laughs> it was in the first symposium for our fifth anniversary. As Tony has said, I was the um, chairman, first chairman of the uh, statutory IPCC when it uh, was established in 2009. Um, so compared to Robert, my time was not exactly a smooth uh, time. You can imagine during 2009, well, I started at 2008, then I uh, was given the task of building up the statutory IPCC, uh, hiring the secretariat, including the Secretary General, Secretary General legal advisor, our former Secretary General is still here somewhere in the audience. Uh, Cherry was there when we hired her, and then later on with Daniel, the Deputy uh, Secretary General, and, and our uh, devoted staff. Uh, it was a challenging time. It was very challenging, not only because it was the uh, inaugural uh, term, but also because of the uh, high awareness of the public, in particular, in relation to a lot of uh, public order events. And also one factual correction, Tony, I did not take over from Robert. Uh, I took over from Ronnie Wong, yeah, who unfortunately uh, can't be here today. Um, but it was uh, a time when uh, I'm uh, sorry to say, at that time, the relationship between the police, the force, and IPCC was not the best. And the relationship between IPCC and the public was almost non-existent. Um, we, our, uh, when we say we, our council had the task of building up IPCC. And I'm very grateful to members of my council who gave me a lot of good ideas as to how uh, we could do our work properly. And one of the things I would like to share with you is that the uh, upon our initiative, we try to reach out to members of the force to build up that confidence. And by reaching out, we do not just simply say, we give a call to CP and, and go to have tea with him. We say, we actually want to reach out to the frontline staff, to the frontline police officers, to let them know what we do, why we share the same objective, that we are in the same boat in most cases, that our aim is common, that is to improve service quality and provide better service to the citizens of Hong Kong. And for that aim, we are in the, we were in the same boat. Of course, we would be monitoring their, com their complaints against them, but that was also for the purpose, as the speaker has, has, has spoken before, to improve service. So we said we wanted to to reach out to the front line. And 
to our very pleasant surprise, and I pay tribute to the uh, leaders of the force at that time we were dealing with, uh, uh, the CP at the time, and they were very open, and we say, can we visit frontline officers in their district? Can we go and see them? Not for summon them to see us in our office, but we go to see them. I will go to see them. My vice chairman, my council, we all go to see them and tell them face to face, in my own mouth, what I want to do. And I want them to tell me what they think of us and what they want to do, they want us to do. The curry lunch, of course, is extra. <laughs> <laughs> so we visited all the police districts in every two years, in every time, oh. all of them. We have one visit uh, every two months or every quarter. And every two, two years, every term, I think we set a two-year cycle, we visited all of the, of the districts. And we always have a uh, one-day visit. In the morning, we visit the, uh, the, the commanders and the, the, the commanding party uh, to discuss the issues specific to their, to their district, be it drugs or be it traffic or whatever. And then we have the curry lunch, which is fantastic. And then in the afternoon, we have a discussion with frontline officers, and we invite them. Well, of course, we tell them what we have been doing, and we want them to tell us the difficulties that they face in the policing issues and, and the daily challenges that they face, so that we have a better understanding, not just from the complainant's point of view, but from the police point of view as well, to enable us to deal with our uh, monitoring work much better. And I have to say, very pleasant, pleasant uh, very happily, we were very well received. I do remember, in particular, the first occasion we went to uh, New Territory South, and the police officers that we were seeing, you could see them there, they were there, they, were, they didn't have, they didn't believe that we were there in the first place. You know, who are these people? And you can see the distrust on their face. But at the end of the discussion, you can see that they have actually changed. They actually told us what they think. They told us of their experience and told us of their difficulties. They actually, I hope, trusted us. And that led to uh, um, uh, improvement of our relationship, not just with Capo, but hopefully with the force in general. And I told them, look, not only just you, the selected few, however you are selected, when you go back to your district, tell your colleagues that we want to see them as well. This is our message. Please pass on our message. And hopefully that, that did some good. At the same time, we try to reach out to the public. And you have heard that in, I think, 2010, we started our uh, participation. I wouldn't say observation, but we passed, uh, started our participation in the 1st of July um, uh, demonstrations. We were there ourselves. As observer, as well, we won't say as observer as such. We want to see what's happening. Uh, observer has our technical meaning, as Tony has said, and under the IPCC system, we are not acting as that kind of observer. But yes, as an observer to see what is happening, and we were very well received by the members of the foreign member public. Uh, we start. We, we started there um, uh, before the, the the demonstration began, about an hour to see how the police were dealing with the people coming in. And that was before any complaint. Been There's no complaint. We just took the initiative to understand the difficulties involving uh, in in the particularly the crowd control. There were no complaints as such, but there were always uh, issues about why close this issue, close this entrance, the Victoria Park, uh, why the route has to be in the particular way. There were always discussions, put it that way. Um, so we've tried to see what happened, and a number of us stayed until past midnight till the end of the procession. Because after the procession, there were demonstrations and so on. We stayed until midnight. And one of the members uh, very kindly treated us to a sumptuous meal as well. So that, that was another uh, extra. And he continued. And whenever we had any function, that particular member always had an excuse that he has won in the races, and he always treated us to meals. And therefore, all at the same time, we, um, we forged a very close working and personal relationship with members of my councils, and some of them are still here today. And I still, some of them, we, we kept in touch. And in those days, we had an easy time as well, in the way, in the council. We had people from all spectrums with positive views. It's getting uneasy. It's getting uneasy. But in those days, we had 
ultra conservative people, and we have people on the other side who are considered to be what one may, what with a simple term, pandems, so right. to speak. These are a bit more liberal, and again, some some are troublemakers. It's like one of those <laughs> sitting here today as well. <laughs> but as far as I remember, as far as I remember, there was only one occasion when we did not have a consensus. There was only one occasion when we actually had to have a vote. Only one during my six years. Only once when we had that, um, when we, ourselves, the council, could not have a unanimous uh, consensus decision. There was also one occasion when we could not agree with Kaplan, and we referred the matter to the chief executive, and as far as I remember, he never replied. <laughs> <laughs> as far as the future is concerned, uh, Kevin, you talk about history. As far as the future is concerned, um, to have a slightly more serious note, five years ago, I was here, probably standing, probably sitting, and I was posing a challenge to the audience at that time. Uh, when I sit on a body, a governing body of whatever it is, whether chairman or member, I always think we are doing this now. Uh, what, are, what is our position? What do we do in five years? What is our status? What is our position in society, in the system, in 10 years, 20 years? And if we want to be in a different capacity or different situation, we have to, in five years say we have to start our preparation now. So that was the challenge I posed to the audience five years ago. And I haven't been following very closely the development of IPCC, but from our, well, I, I read the newsletters and whatever, there's something new that I, I come to my way, I, I pay attention. As far as I can see, we haven't actually done very much in that regard. I'm sure that there must be a lot of things discussed and behind the scenes, but no, uh, nothing uh, positive has been uh, implemented so far. But I would see, I would like to see a bit more discussion as to the role of IPCC and the role of the uh, and, and also the uh, structure of the police complaint system, whether it could be improved in any particular way. Do we have to have a two-tier system? And if we have a two-tier system, what exactly was, should be the IPCC doing yeah. uh, with more initiative in any particular area? Could we have a hybrid system, for example, in some jurisdiction, in the UK, for example, uh, they have a full-time commissioner um, in some cons constabularies, and they could by themselves decide to uh, undertake investigation of some more serious cases in some which are less controversial or less serious cases, they could be uh, directly monitoring the handling of the complaint, that sort of yes. thing. I I'm sure these important issues will continue to be discussed in today's many sessions. Uh, not only this one, but in the <coughs> following ones. Um, but anyway, so my, I would like to see a bit more proactive discussion of IPCC's roles and functions um, yeah. Well, may I say, even use the word power yes. uh, in the light uh, of the changing society and changing uh, the societal values in terms of the freedom and the uh, rule of law and the freedom of and rights of the citizens and proper policing and so on. So that's my hope. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chen. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I would invite Mr. Larry Kuo. Um, to share with us his experience as chairman of the IPCC. And I'm sure your four years is uh, the very uneasy years, and uh, most turbulent years. Peace. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to express my thanks to the previous chairman of IPCC, the council members, uh, as well as uh, the secretary of staff, uh, and also, as Tony just said, the unsung hero of IPCC, the observers, uh, for before my time for building up and establishing IPCC, a solid foundation from which I took over as chairman. My role uh, as chairman of the IPCC uh, was not short of memorable experience. Some people say my term was full of excitement. Uh, it would appear more like to me in overheated kitchen. <laughs> I took up the position uh, of the IPCC chairman uh, on June, 1st of June 2014. Not long after that, the social climate in Hong Kong quickly tensed up. 
Then came the 1st of July procession. We conducted an on-site observation of the procession. The, the observation went on from before noon the way past midnight, more than 12 hours altogether. And it was particularly hot and humid that day. Everyone, as far as I can remember, was completely wet with sweat. There were some, according to some reports, there were some 500,000 people taking part in the procession that day. And because of this on-site observation, I had to postpone my trip to the UK for my daughter's graduation. About two months later, the Occupy movement broke out and went on for 79, 79 days. We then conducted another long day on-site observation of the Occupy movement clearance operation in Admiralty. When we were still recovering from the Occupy movement, the Mongkok riot happened in 2016. During the Occupy movement, IPCC had gone through extremely difficult times. Council members and secretariat were under immense pressure and almost unbearable at times. We had to deal with a lot of things at the same time. I got telephone calls in the middle of the night. There were over 30,000 complaints or allegations against council members, which were later found by an independent panel to be unfounded and unsubstantiated. The Occupy movement was the single incident which had given rise to the most complaints in the history of IPCC. There were altogether 172 <coughs> reportable complaints and 357 notifiable complaints. Some concern groups even openly said that they knew that there was not much that the IPCC could do at that time, but still, in order to exert pressure on the police and the government, they would vilify the IPCC. We also had to tackle many unexpected and unforeseen situations one after another. The next day, after the police used tear gas, I got a resignation letter from a council member in order to express disagreement about the police use of tear gas. And that came like a bombshell at that time. I explained to the member that the resignation will not help to ease the already tense situation but would instead make the matter far worse by putting huge pressure on the government, the IPCC, and also the police force. I had to use all the limited charm that I had to convince the member. And I was almost on my knees to back the member, in private, of course. <laughs> Fortunately, the member finally softened, softened up and withdrew the resonation, avoiding a potential disaster. When the IPCC was convening an internal meeting to discuss the case about Superintendent Ju, some people got tipped off about the meeting. A large group of protesters gathered at the IPCC office, and some even tried to storm it. Two bands of police officers were on standby near the office building in case something went wrong. When an incident broke out, some stakeholders used the media to put pressure on IPCC to provide immediate commentaries or opinions about the incident. And this was totally unfair for both the potential complainants or complainees. The IPCC had yet to obtain any kind of factual report about the incident. But at that time, resistance to succumb to these pressures had been extremely challenging. As a matter of human psychology, there was always great temptation to say things which people wanted to hear, 
in order to just ease the pressure and perhaps even to win some applause. Given the divisive social atmosphere at the time of the Occupy movement, many people, including some council members, naturally had strong views about anything that happened. It was therefore a big challenge for all of us to maintain a balanced perspective and remain calm and missed all the tensions and emotions. As for aspirations and expectations in the future, the present challenge that we are all facing is that our society has become increasingly divided. What makes the situation even worse is that in the age of social media, which Tony alluded at his opening speech, it is easy to disguise lies as truths and portray truths as lies. Some people have become more emotional and confrontational. People see things in terms of camps, or even worse, perceived camps. So even though if you're not in a camp, you're not with me, you are against me. And then they will form their opinion accordingly, without looking at the facts. On the other hand, people's expectation towards police services is higher and more demanding. And hence, incidents involving conflicts of police power and citizens' rights will increase. With wide media coverage, more complicated and controversial complaint cases will arise. In such situation, it will be particularly important for IPCC to stay calm, clear-minded, and uphold the core values of independence, impartiality, and integrity in the way they should be. IPCC should remain steadfast in maintaining a balanced view and an independent stance in its work. IPCC's role can help to bring public confidence and trust in the police force. No man is an island, no society is an island. IPCC has to keep up with its exchanges with oversight bodies in, overseas juris in other overseas jurisdictions in order to share experience and insights concerning public police oversight and complaint system. And this will also help IPCC to keep pace with the ever-changing social and political climate. As a matter of human psychology, uh, there is always a great temptation going forward to just ease the pressure of criticism by saying things people wish wanted to hear and perhaps to win some applause. We all need to be very careful not to fall into such a trap and run the risk of compromising our independence and integrity. And it is always good to always uh, to remember the fundamental principle or the uh, fundamental objective why IPP, IPCC was set up. IPCC was to set up in a nutshell to provide a check and balance on police power and there, thereby protecting citizens' rights. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Thank you for sharing all these inside stories during those turbulent years. Um, if time allows, I would definitely like to invite all the past chairmen to share with us I mean, how IPCC should do in the time of confidence crisis and um, social and political polarization like what we saw in the year 2014 and afterward, how can ICCC perform its roles uh, in such environment? But before uh, that, I would like to invite Mr. Leo to share with us his experience as chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Kevin, and thank you for, for sharing this for us. And I'd like to thank all my predecessors for coming, and of course, Lionel for, for coming from Macau. Uh, it's been very, very interesting hearing the views of my predecessors. I've only been in the job for a year, so uh, I've not been really 
as tested as, in fact, as all of my predecessors, particularly poor Larry, who's been, <laughs> who's been really tested in his four years. Uh -uh. And, um, but I, I, I see some recurring themes. Uh, the most important recurring theme from my predecessors is that really the importance of, of impartiality and independence. And that is a, a, an important core value that uh, the IPCC has continuously had. Uh, and, and I would like to think that uh, we would ourselves, of course, continue with this very important core value. The, the second uh, uh, theme, particularly from Robert, for example, that he, he would really like to see, in fact, that, uh, that our members represent a, a wide spectrum of views. I think that is important. Um, because, uh, and particularly the views which reflect, in fact, the expectations of the community. Uh, that is very, very important. I, I don't have uh, any kind of influence uh, in uh, appointing our members. Because nowadays, in fact, uh, we are not consulted. But nonetheless, uh, um, uh, I, I would think that uh, the government should take heed, in fact, uh, of this view, particularly from all our, our predecessors and myself. Um, but that said, I have found that our members, I mean, in the last year, they do represent a wide spectrum of views, although they, they're not necessarily representative of a wide spectrum of the political uh, camps which are within the community. Uh, our members at the moment tend to be from the professional uh, areas, education, law, engineering, uh, finance. Uh, our three vice chairmen comes from uh, a political spectrum, which you might say would tend to be sort of pro-government uh, political spectrum. Uh, uh, and uh, so, so we don't have sort of people from the other political spectrum uh, within the... Uh, within the uh, but that, again, said, I, I have found our members over the past year to be fiercely independent. And uh, they, they do the job as independently uh, as I would expect. Um, but um, the other theme that uh, particularly Jet has put forward is, is, is this, is that uh, we really need to know what are the views of the people that we, uh, we, we are supposed to, uh, to audit. In other words, the people that, uh, who, who have to perform their jobs and difficult jobs in the front line. Uh, that, I think, is, is extremely important. The commissioner's policy, of course, is one of zero tolerance, as Robert has said. But that, again, said, Every police officer has to deal with difficult issues uh, all the time. Uh, and, and therefore, really, we, we must understand uh, the issues, the problems, and then see how we can improve things. Uh, that is very, very important. Another thing that, uh, that Jet said, and I, I think it's very important, is that what has got the IPCC uh, uh, to show for, for its work? I think that is, uh, that is an, an important aspect. Now we've had, uh, for example, the press in the past few days have said that, well, you haven't really, you know, in the past 10 years, we really haven't done much, really. Uh, uh, in, uh, and uh, now that, that actually, in a sense, uh, has got all of us thinking, in fact, not even in the past two days, but in the past year. And uh, how can we show for what we have done? Uh, and in, in a sense, the nature of a work uh, requires us to keep our work confidential, but at the same time, uh, we have done a lot, and how can we show for it? I think that, that is an important thing. And, and what, in fact, uh, are our, our own plans for the future? And, and I think that is a very important thing. Um, and, of course, Larry has, has also put forward one view, is that when, we are, when the community is divided, uh, how can we, we then perform our job well? Chief Executive in his speech has said that the police now faces 10,000 uh, public order events a year. In fact, uh, and, and how do we then deal with that? I, I think those are the important questions that we have to address. Now, in the past year, what I have found and, and, and have to uh, consider, and we have been discussing this among ourselves, are three things. The first is that we have found that the number of complaints have certainly decreased and uh, from uh, 4,500 uh, 10 years ago now to 1,500. If you look at the 1,500 complaints that we have to deal with, very close to 90% are 
are what are called sort of generally minor complaints. They fall into two categories. Fifty, well, the 90 percent, about 50 percent, they deal with people, complaints about police officers not doing the, what they're supposed to do. In other words, not doing their duty. That's about 50 percent. Another 40 percent, in fact, are police officers, in fact, being rude, in fact, uh, using foul language. Uh, and so on. So those are the sort of two types of complaints, which make up 90 percent. The remaining 10 percent, in fact, in fact, 7 percent of that are police officers actually bashing people up. In other words, they assaulting people. Uh, so that's about, you know, of the 10 percent, 10, 7 percent of that is, you know, police officers assaulting, in fact, people. Now. And then about 3% would be sort of different things, like manufacturing evidence, for example. You know, in Chinese, called Chai Sang Jiok, on that. Uh, uh, now, uh, so, but only 1% of that. The second thing is that uh, they, uh, 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 they don't, uh, 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 there's just a, another 2% of this, uh, are sort of miscellaneous types of uh, wrongdoing. And those are serious things, essentially. These types of, so the serious types of offenses tend to go into the minority at the moment, and the not so serious types tend to go into the majority uh, right now. Now, then, if you go further into those statistics, and we find that uh, although each member, in fact, uh, have to do their work very carefully, and each of us, in fact, have a, a full list of cases that uh, the, uh, uh, the Secretariat has looked at from CAPO every week. So each of us deal with about 10 cases a week. Uh, I deal with the final type of cases after each group, in fact, has done their work. And um, they, we find that, in fact, uh, within the, the types of cases that have come forward, a very large number of those cases uh, are cases where uh, neither CAPO nor us can actually substantiate the complaint. They tend to be sort of relatively minor ones, even, but they, they cannot substantiate this. And why? That is because uh, there is no third party that's come forward to give you objective evidence. Hmm. Now, I, I think there is, there's something amiss in that. There's also another group of complaints, uh, which also falls in the majority, is that people finally give up, in a sense, after they've made a complaint. They said, you know, I don't want to go through all of this. In effect, with 1,500 complaints, of the 1,500 complaints, over 800 are these types of cases. In other words, you know, they made a complaint, and then they then say, I don't want to go through with it. Uh, now, if they don't want to go through with it, then what do they do? What they do is that they put it in a box called expression of dissatisfaction. In other words, I'm not satisfied, so I'm not going to go through with it. There's 800 odd of those. 700 odd goes through the full investigation process. And going through this investigation process, we still have a large number where we have unsubstantiated because there is no third party evidence involved. I think we, we, we need to study this a little bit more because as I've said in my opening address to, to all of you, is that for every unsubstantiated case, even though there's no third party, there's probably some kind of objective evidence, in fact, which could, could indicate the credibility of that particular uh, uh, complaint. So that, that itself needs uh, more resolution, in other words, uh, a deeper look at each of these cases. So that, that means basically we, we need, and, and uh, this, kind of uh, uh, um, reaction. In fact, not only came from myself, but many of our members who looked through these cases. And, and, and therefore, really, the next Tony, step... Sorry. Time is running out. Running, okay, the next step we need to do is to, to look, at, look at that. Now, I just want to mention just two more things before I, I conclude. The second thing, as uh, Larry have said, is that there are lots and lot more of public order events. But we have issues such as the water cannon, for example which are coming forward. So what, what I think we need to have is actually more transparency in terms of the principles we apply. Uh, 
the, the UK, for example, the Home Office, has in fact a code of uh, professional practice, in fact, in terms of public order events. And, and uh, these are all matters of principle that we could all consider, and uh, we do need that transparency. And finally, I, I would just make one point, which is that the, the IPCC could, could only be as good as uh, the work of its members. Uh, and therefore, uh, uh, what, what we have been doing in the, in the past year and looking to the future, uh, uh, we need to, to, to have a, a sharper eye in, in what we do. And we need to work with uh, our partners uh, in, in, in this complaint system with the police, which is why in my opening address, I see a, a, a great alignment of interests between us and the police force to ensure that the zero tolerance policy in fact continues. Mm. So that, that is a work for the future. And uh, finally, I would just say one thing. I, uh, I've not had sort of uh, sumptuous dinners and curry lunches, <laughs> uh, and I look forward to that. <laughs> uh, it's not a complaint, it's a, it's, it's a hope for the future. Looking forward, it's for the future. It's a notifiable complaint. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt you, but uh, your staff has wisely put me in this position where I, the clock is right in front of me. So, um, because I want to use the remaining 10 minutes of this session to invite Mr. Jack and Mr. Tang to share with us uh, responses after hearing Larry's sharing of his difficult time when there is a confidence crisis, when the society is so polarized, I mean, how can IC, IPCC function properly in such difficult environments? Could, could you share with us some of your wisdom? Well, as I've said, I had a very easy time. But um, I think during the tenure of Jet and Larry. It seems to me that the IPCC have emerged from all this turmoil unscathed. And indeed, I would say that they have uh, emerged with their reputation enhanced. Um, I think there has been a one or two uh, prosecution of uh, uh, policemen arising out of the uh, uh, Occupy uh, movement. And um, um, and, and I think they followed uh, upon complaints made to the IPCC. So uh, during Larry's uh, tenure, um, I don't think uh, anyone uh, uh, who, who is uh, interested in the, in the, the uh, oversight of uh, police uh, should have anything to complain about. Uh, in the case of Jet, uh, probably because of his age, you, the IPCC had become even more energetic. And he started uh, the um, uh, very, uh, I think, uh, novel and laudable uh, uh, practice of actually um, going, um, well, uh, going to uh, uh, public order events. And I, I think the presence uh, of the chairman and members of the IPCC uh, probably um, contributed uh, to the uh, order uh, of the uh, uh, of the uh, people participating, both uh, the police and uh, uh, people who were there uh, doing whatever uh, they were doing. They know uh, that uh, someone is watching, and uh, both sides uh, put on uh, their better behavior anyway, <laughs> and not necessarily the best. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Robert. Um, <clears throat> I would think um, in the time of difficulty, um, as uh, Anthony and Larry and Robert have said, we have to maintain our impartiality and independence. But one of the important things, particularly these days and age, impression image is important. You can say, I'm independent, I've gone through a process where we have 
we have fierce debate and so on. But if people do not believe in your position, your starting point, then you are almost doomed from the start. I think one of the more important things that I would think the government can consider, uh, as Tony has acknowledged in a way, although uh, it's not within our control, but it is the United government, is the, appoint is the appointment. It's the members of the council. I would think it would be helpful to the uh, status and work of the IPCC. If the government will continue the good tradition that I have enjoyed, Robert has enjoyed, and so on, and when people from different political spectrums or even uh, key opinion leaders mm. to be on the council and let people know what the council has been doing and therefore if in a situation where you have controversies but it has the controversy has been debated considered through a council with different views mm. From different perspective, and nevertheless, you can come up with a consensus or at least a strong opinion that commands respect. And people can see from that process that you know that these lot of people, there are ultra loyalists, there are there are very liberal people, but nevertheless, they sit down and they have obviously uh, done their job, discussed the point, and they have come up with a strong consensus opinion or independent opinion and that adds to the credibility and that lets the people know that you have been doing your work and you have been doing your work in an impartial way. So just like the legal system in a way, justice must not only be done, but it must be seen, manifestly seen to have been done. Thank you, Mr. Chen. Thank you. And I believe Larry would also want to respond to the... Uh, actually, I just want to sort of like share some uh, happy encounters uh, uh, with all of you here, and which in a way uh, endorse what Robert just said. Uh, after so many years of turmoil, I think uh, IPCC has emerged unscathed, uh, and we have been sort of, as Jet said, we've been able to maintain our independence and uh, impartiality uh, uh, during the, sort of in the middle of the Occupy movement and thereafter. Um, and uh, I do every now and then, uh, you know, met up with some people on the streets or in shopping malls. They come up to me and, you know, to, to show, express their appreciation of, of IPCC's hard work, or not my work, IPCC's hard work, uh, during the difficult times. They do appreciate it. And another uh, encounter is that uh, uh, with a well-known academic uh, in the field of public survey um, said to me, uh, he said, uh, several years ago, he said, despite the survey results, he personally thought IPCC has been doing a very good job. And he encouraged IPCC to keep up with his uh, good work and not to be discouraged or distracted uh, by the noises. Uh, he also said, uh, I hope I you know, remember what he said exactly, but uh, the IPCC is a central pillar to the integrity of the police force. And IPCC is a, is a particularly important institution in today's uh, polarized social climate. And, and IPCC work is essential but difficult, in particular in this time of you know, uh, divisive uh, social atmosphere. Uh, thank you. Thank so you. it is quite morale boosting and you know, happy moments. People do appreciate what we do. Uh, finally, I would like to invite Mr. Helpers to uh, share with us Briefly, your feeling and responses to what our IPCC chairmen have uh, said during the session. Would you like to give some comment? Thank you very much. Uh, fortunately, we didn't, in the past 14 years, have uh, such experience as in Hong Kong. We didn't have the Occupy Sat Malo as a mainstream <laughs> account. We didn't have uh, Mong Kok problems. Uh, so this is uh, a God bless. <laughs> so I, I, I can't share with my colleagues uh, Macau experience in these critical moments, in these critical moments. Uh, nevertheless, Macau is so near to Hong Kong, uh, we have followed uh, what happened. And we highly appreciate the attitude of the policemen, 
the attitude of the police women and also uh, the attitude of IPCC, our colleagues. Uh, it was a good time to learn how to make a society more harmonious. Uh, Hong Kong society is much more divided than in Macau. Macau society is uh, more peaceful, <laughs> if you allow me this expression. Uh, but anyway, we need to learn and how to react, how to react. So, in conclusion, what I can take from this panel is the importance in a civilized society to have something like IPCC of Hong Kong and in parts of the world. And the most important pillar, the most important pillar is the independency and to be impartial, independent, objective. Find a fair solution. Otherwise, if you cannot transmit the fair solutions to the society, the people will not trust on us. So I think our main task is how to get the confidence from the society, from the citizens, from the population, and to achieve this important target is our daily work must be under the law, under the rule of law, under what we Romans say, exequate bono, according to law, but find the fair solution. So this is a big achievement that I have today, and my colleagues from Macau, I think so, also agree with me. Thank, Thank you, you Mr. Alphys. Thank you. Um, at the clock, turn 11.59, I have to call an end here to fulfill my promise to the MC that I will end the session before 12. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lau's moderation. <laughs> and please stay on the stage. Um, we will now invite IPCC Chairman uh, Dr. Neil to present the news to our guests. First, please, Mr. Lau, please. Mr. Jack, please. Thank you. Mr. Tan, please. Mr. Kwok, please. The last one, Mr. Alphas, please. Let's stay close together and we are going to take a group photo. sharing and please take a seat off the stage first. Thank you. Next we are we're going to start the first plenary session. The topic is overseas development of police oversight policies practicalities and challenges from international perspectives. We are delighted to have the heads of oversized bodies of different overseas jurisdictions, and they're going to share the development of their police complaint system in light of their respective social landscape and policing culture, as well as their organization's challenges and achievements. <laughs> 